Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. We are going to do something very, uh, very important this time. Uh, even though all our shows are very important, and we've had lots of things on medical and entertainment, but whenever I talk to people from Faith Farm Ministries, I, I feel it is very important because people are hurting, and when they get there, they are really taken in, uh, in, in like it's a womb almost. And I, don't, I use that word with great love. So Rick Aspden is, the, uh, is, is our, our deputy CEO of Faith Farm. And I really have to say that we have a lot of people who are, I'm sorry, I have something happen here to my Facebook and I don't know what's happened. So I'm just gonna let it uh, sit here because I don't know why it's not on. Oh, now it is on, okay. It just goes on and off sometimes. So I just started my, my just started it again. But for those of you who are not on Facebook Live and you're on the radio instead, this will be good enough for you. But people who are on Facebook, uh, it's it's a very nice thing that we do that. So Rick Aspiden, let me go back to this again. Rick is the deputy CEO of Faith Farm Ministries. And I've been talking about Faith Farm Ministries for so long, I probably could talk about it in my sleep because I know it so well. I have not been one of the students, but I have been around so many of the students, people who are hurting, people who have families who are hurting, but what, whom I like really so much are, are the people who help them, the staff. Rick has been one of the big staff members there, and he has such a big heart, as do so many of the women who help there also. Uh, the board does a lot. But I think what people need to know is that there are three campuses. Now, when we say campuses, and I'm going to have Rick explain this, um, they are, it's not like a university campus. It's a very serious campus. So, Rick, why don't we start off when we talk about the three, the three faith farm ministry locations. That's how I'm going to say it. Why don't you talk a little bit about the one in Fort Lauderdale? We'll start with that one. Well, it's a great place to start because that's where uh, Pappy started Faith Farm Ministries is in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, the campus uh, there in Fort Lauderdale has been around a long time. Uh, it's a, a 10 and a half acre campus. And, um, you know, we ser serve approximately 150 students at various stages of the, of the program. And uh, they do just an amazing job down there at um, ministering to the students that are caught up in new addiction. Of course, we have our thrift store uh, down there and, and our, our different micro industries that uh, we use to support the ministry. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a great place for um, people in the Fort Lauderdale area. And, they, you know, they come from, you know, our students come from all over the nation uh, to the different campuses that we have. Uh, some like the um, urban setting, which that's the Fort Lauderdale setting. Uh, some like, a, you know, more of a... Um, um, well, the inner city setting, excuse me, that's for Fort Lauderdale. The urban setting is is um, Boynton Beach. And then the rural setting, of course, is our Okeechobee campus. I never thought in terms of that. That's true. You do have three settings. And people, do they get to choose which setting they want to go to? They do. They do. Um, so if, uh, if one of our students is looking for a recovery, they can apply to one of the campuses, and they have a choice of which campus they apply to. Now, if they're a returning student, um, sometimes, you know, we'll, we may be able to assess them and see, you know, where they're at and we may uh, steer them to a campus, uh, one or another, if we feel that they would do a much better job um, getting their recovery at one of those campuses as opposed to the one that they may have come from. Uh, so we, we do do that, but they have a choice, yeah. So what is the difference, though? I mean, do you do the same Everything is the same in a sense. In a sense, everything is the same. The, the uh, you know the program is very uh, very much the same on on all three campuses, um, and I'm sure, you know, when you talk to each each specific campus, of course, their campus is better. But uh -huh, right. uh, you the know, baseball games it, they sure, all talk about it, that. You know, it's like, but um, but you know, and that's all in fun and camaraderie. But uh, you know, the campuses are very very much the same, and they do. Um, minister in much the same way of each each of the other campuses 
Okay, so let's start uh, off with just somebody is an addict in a lot of different ways and, um, you know, from other things, from drugs, from alcohol, um, and somebody recommends that they go there uh, to one of the places at Faith Farm Ministries. What actually happens? Take us through something like that. Well, uh, we get a lot of calls from moms, you know, aunts, sisters, um, and, and of course, husbands to, to, um, for their loved ones that are caught up into addiction. Uh, but at the end of the day, unless that actual person that's in active addiction uh, starts the process, we can't do anything. Um, and so they need to fill out an application online to apply to come to one of the campus locations. And then there's a, um, an interview process that we do to, um, that goes through the different uh, inter- inter- um, intake stances. And so they can um, determine whether it's a good fit or not. And, and what, how do people differ? And this is a kind of a big loaded question. When they come, how, how do they differ? Well, I mean, the sky's the limit on this because <laughs> we serve, you know, every uh, aspect of, of society. Um, we'll have people that show up in, in um, you know, a white jumpsuit or orange jumpsuit with handcuffs. Um, really? And then we'll have people that uh, show up that are completely homeless. And then we'll have people that show up that, you know, their parents come in driving, um, you know, a Maserati. Fancy car. So, you know, it's all all different aspects of society that um, come to Faith Farm to get help for their addictions. But at the end of the like I said, at the end of the day, it's up to that individual person and whether they want help or not. Uh, a lot of them need it. Um, only a certain percentage of them actually want it. <laughs> I was just going to ask you. So probably the guy that or woman that comes in the Maserati is very arrogant. <laughs> uh, sometimes, yeah, and, yeah. and it really depends. You know, it really does depend. Uh, a lot of times, um, depending on how much people have lost. Uh, you know, and uh, it's interesting because when a lot of times when. Um, you talk to people that are caught up into addiction, uh, get them in a relaxed atmosphere, and, and they begin to war story. And, and it, what war storying is is talking about their past and, and different things and, and the fun of what they've experienced. But what we find is that nobody wants to talk about the loss. And so that's one of the things that we have to talk about. We have to talk about the, the relationships that have been destroyed because of their addiction. We have to st- talk about the material things that they've lost because of their addiction. Um, we have to talk about the jobs that have been forfeited because of their addiction. We have to talk about all these different things because uh, when they really begin to understand what loss they've, they've endured because of their addiction, uh, it becomes real to them, and, and, and that's something that, that um, we have to address pretty early in the program. And, and everybody thinks they can do it themselves, don't they? Every, but, well, you know, generally speaking, by the time they get to Faith Farm, they've exhausted almost every one of their avenues of, uh, you know, trying to, to uh, address this situation in their life. And so usually speaking, they come pretty broken. And so, um, which is a great spot for us to begin to minister to. I mean, you, know, you hate to say that's a great spot, but when it comes to addiction, um, you know, we really need to get them. When they, when they come, they have to realize that they are powerless over this thing. And when we talk about that, we, you know, we, we realize, in fact, every time I see whether the... Um, the I guess, I don't know, the the big boats that come in with all the uh, fentanyl or the the marijuana, not marijuana, much worse than that, they come in and you see millions of, I don't know, how much comes in, and that's really how they even got themselves in trouble, isn't it? Sure. I mean... Just by, you know, here's the thing, there's so many different reasons why they started using, Um, you know, I mean... It's it's from strife in the family when they were little. Um, many of them started using at a very young age. Uh, many of them used with parents. 
which really? is which is just crazy when you begin to think about it. But it's a, it's the truth. M- many many uh, of um, addicts, struggling addicts, had had used with their parents in the, you know at a young age, or they'd been growing up in in the environment of drugs and alcohol, mm. and so um, that kind of gets perpetuated in their life. Wow, I've never heard of that, but I I'm, I guess you hear everything, don't you? Oh yeah, we we hear about everything. Yeah. And, and so, are they? Is it mostly? It's not mostly alcohol as it was many years ago. But does alcohol go along with it? Do they do both? Absolutely, a- absolutely, it goes along with it. And when you know, um, like you said, most are, a, good, a large percentage of of our students that come into the program are are drugs. Um, you know, some some are are alcoholics, but the the um, drugs and alcohol kind of go together. And so when we're when we're talking about recovery, um, you know, if if I could, if you come and you you come into Faith Farm and you have a heroin addiction, um, you know, you're just not going to be off heroin. You're going to have to be off all substances. So, you know, the idea is you're not going to go be able to go out and drink. Because when you go out and drink, that's going to fire that part of the brain that's going to take you right back into your main addiction, which may be heroin or whatever it was, crack or whatever it was. And so, um, you know, we try to promote uh, total abstinence from any type of alcohol or uh, drug-related thing after recovery so that they can stay in recovery. This is a very interesting conversation, and I would just tell you this, that... um, I don't drink or smoke. I never have. And I and and it's hard for me to understand that. But as being a human and someone who has a great heart, I know I pride myself on being a big humanitarian. I hurt for those people. Sure. But I'm wondering, is this something that's in their genes? I mean, how much and I know you're not a doctor, but what is it is it is it some people more prone to become an addict than others? Well, I think that I think you know it all depends on who you ask would would give you an answer to that question. I um, you know, I I think that there's there's two you know there's the 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 medical side of things where where people believe that it's a disease, and then uh, there's the other side of things where people don't believe it's a disease. It's socialization. Um, you know, quite frankly, it's both. You know, at the end of the day, it's a, it, there's a lot of different elements that go along with with addiction, but. You know, here's the thing that a lot of people don't won't admit is that we are all addicted to something. Yes, that is true. And and so I like to eat bread. <laughs> <laughs> you like to eat bread. Well, you know, and and so some of our addictions are much more socially acceptable than drugs and alcohol, but not any less destroying. Yeah, but that's that's the problem. And right? and yeah. so um, you know, we have to that that's where we have to really relax on our judgment yes. of uh, people that are caught up into you know quote unquote drug and alcohol addiction is because they're just addicted to something that's not so socially acceptable and much more destructing than maybe the addiction that you have. Now Rick, I've interviewed a lot of people on the show from Faith Faith Farm Ministries, but I'm going to say something today that I've never said before. Yeah. And honestly, oh just because you're so sweet, whatever it is, I'm going to tell you. When I, uh, my husband passed away two, about two and a half years ago, I was married to him for 43 years as my second husband. And when I first met him, he was a very high powered executive in Miami. And I observed him before I really knew him about, he was, you know, dancing around, he had his arms around all the women, he was drinking, you know, and I, and as I told you, I never drank and never took drugs and so for me I didn't like that but somehow I had to go out with him because I was at the art museum and and I did and he was very nice but when we he started getting serious I told him this could not go anywhere if you drink like that because I would not have respect for you do you know that he only drank wine after that? He never drank al- uh, hard liquor? Okay. Now, how was he able to do that? Well, some people don't have the addictive the addictiveness. I mean, there are many people that can they can go out and, and have a drink and, and be completely fine and don't they don't have to have it. Um, others I not thought so you were much. gonna say he just wanted you so much he would do anything. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put words in you. That, that, that's that. That may be true. 
for him. Well, I'm trying to do a broad sense here. I know, I know, I know. Here. I'm um, being very you, light here. You know, here's the, here's the thing is that, that um, you know, there are many people that can have a, a, a glass of they wine for, for dinner with, right. and it can be completely fine right. and it doesn't control them and, and they're fine. But the people that find themselves at Faith Farm, that's not an option for them. So it's either systemic or it's been in their history so long that they can't. Right. Is that what you're you know, saying? Well, and, you know, we call, we call it in, in the faith-based, um, you know, we call it a generational curse sometimes. It's a generational curse that's passed down from, from father to son or, or mother to daughter type thing. Um, you know, in the secular world, they call it, you know, genetic um, and so both play a part in my, you know, in, in my aspect of, of looking at it. Um, you know, Judy I have a, Blake Walters is watching. Oh yeah, hey Judy. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's um, it's very interesting when you really get into the nuts and bolts of you know talking with people that are struggling in addiction and trying to help them in the different ways that we help them. Um, you know one person you know it's more of an individual thing than it is a corporate thing you know sometimes you have to deal individually with people uh to help them get through um this thing called addiction yeah and it's such a big responsibility that you've taken on that you your organization has taken on think about it over 65 years or more yeah 68 that you have been changing people's lives and it's not on just their lives. It's their families' lives. It's the generations. It's over and over. It's the businesses. How many businesses lost their employees because of it? I mean, it is so big, and you need to have so many pats on your back. And that's why it's my time to say, please donate to Faith Farm Ministries. I've always said this. Mm. Put it in your will. Uh, if you have some extra dollars, if you have $10,000, whatever you have, please. It's the one organization that you can be assured is doing great things and i i cannot uh you know i have a lot of listeners a lot of read people who read boomer times and i have to say um it's there are a lot of charities out there and i understand that but if you would see the results of faith farm ministries you would write a check to them or or i mean look you can go to their thrift shops you can buy you can sell you can do things but they need cash and cash will really help a lot of people because right now you take care of about what four over four hundred. We have we have enough. Uh, we have beds for four hundred and forty uh, students, and so and we're you not have at meals capacity. Four hundred and forty students. Right, right. You oh, know, when you when you consider just off the top of my head, you're considering that um, you know we have about approximately um, six hundred meals a day. Um, you know that gets distributed at the three campuses um actually that's probably not the right number it's probably more close to 900 meals a day they get distributed to to the um three campuses you know um it's a lot it's a lot it, it is i mean i can't even fathom it and and you do this i mean this is not a money-making organization people have to understand that this is a heartwarming organization and I can't say enough about Faith Farm Ministries. I know they we have beautiful articles written every month. It really helps you to understand. And, and don't be cruel or harmful to people who have this addiction. You have to help them. But you probably can't help them. In the article that you'll find in the November issue written by Carol Mahoney, she says, don't be mean to someone who's an addict. They've already had meanness. Don't yell at them. Don't. Just be kind and loving, especially at Thanksgiving. It was a great article. Yeah, it was a great article. Carol does a great job at uh, doing some of her writing for us. And, and whatever Carol does, she does with excellence. But when you think about that is true that I guess the parents of a, of a young person who's an addict or the family members, people just yell at them because they, they can't understand and they don't know what else to do. Right? Well, you know, you have to understand it, that um, this thing called addiction is probably one of the most frustrating things that families will ever deal with uh, because they either, you know, if they don't deal with an addiction, they've never been there. They don't understand it. They don't know why you just, you know, can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps and sort yourself out. 
um, it's it's not that thing. That's that's not that how how this gets gets handled, and it's frustrating for people. And, and of course, when they don't understand or they think that they may have done something wrong as a parent, um, and and you know, of course, tempers get there and 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 yelling and and stuff like that happens. Um, you know, here's the biggest thing too is that, you know, a lot of times what we find is that. Uh, instead of allowing yourself to get so frustrated with your loved one that's struggling in addiction, um, try and get them the help that they need, you know. Uh, and that really only comes out of a foundation of love. Uh, berating somebody and, and, uh, and, you know, yelling and screaming at them is not really going to help them move into a place where they can get the help that they need. But encouraging them, and, and I got to say this because, it, and this is the tough part about addiction, is that, Many of the the loved ones that ha- that are that have people in addiction, um, they enable the person, mm-hmm. and and that's uh, it's very difficult because you had to exhibit some tough love sometimes in order for your loved one to get help, and that is it's heartbreaking and it's tough and there's no getting around it. But this is exactly what needs to happen in some cases. Uh, listening to you. Um this isn't just a matter of getting in there and being with a lot of other friends. You have a great program. Why don't you go through the program a little bit? Because I think that's really important that people, because sometimes when people come, they, if you've said this before, um, I'm not, I'm not interested in religion. I just, you know, just help me get clear, right? Right. And sure. So, Sure. So why don't you talk about how you do this? Well, you know, we bring a we bring a student into the program and and uh, into phase what we call phase one. We have a four phase program, and we really begin to just address some of their core issues and kind of getting them to to just realize the denial that a lot of them are in and what this thing called addiction has done to their lives. Um, that's easier for some than others. You know, and again, depending on a lot of different uh, elements to the program, um, we do teach them a lot about scripture. Uh, it is a faith-based program, and we make no qualms about that. Um, we believe that the only way you're going to get through uh, addiction is through Christ Jesus, and so um, we definitely teach them about uh, about Jesus. About, but it's not about uh, a religion; it's about a relationship with Christ, and one that's real one that's uh that's meaningful and most of all one that's personal and so we we teach them how to hear from the lord uh right off the rip so that they can get a a a communion with god and how to hear from him and how to get direction from him and how to live their lives uh that's pretty much phase one phase two is really where we begin to get down to the nitty-gritty um and we call it the onion skin and we peel back the onion skin uh and and really begin to deal with some of the dysfunctions that's gone on uh uh, what you know the fi- financial obligations that 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 they are you know um, the legal obligations that that go along with this uh, the relational um, destruction that's gone along with this and all the different aspects of the d- destruction uh, that is caused by addiction in uh, and that's pretty much phase two in phase three um, we you know and it's a little different on each campus but in phase three um, we like to we like to um, is a, is probably the pivotal point of the program, and it's where we do inner healing. And basically, inner healing is um, we teach some some we have lectures in the morning. It's a half a day class. Uh, we have lectures in the morning, and then. Um, right off the rip and then we move into some processing time to individually process with the students uh, some of their most inner hurts things that you know things that they've never told anybody about what they've either done or had happened to them and really um, begin to process those things with Christ and, and allow Christ to touch those hurts you see here's the thing is that we all have we all have uh, hurts in our lives and um, what happens is is that you know, somebody says something to you and they'll tear the scab off that hurt. And so when it, what happens when a scab gets torn off is it bleeds, it hurts. And that's when we react. Well, 
when in inner healing, what we're doing is we're, we're taking them back to that, that hurt and allowing Christ to deal with that hurt in a, in a, in a, a really productive way. And so after it's been dealt with, it's not that the hurt doesn't exist. It just doesn't hurt anymore. And, and when you're doing this, is this in a group setting? or personal? It is in a group setting. It is in a group setting. It's most beneficial in a group setting. And because what, we, what you'll find out is the students will realize that the guy sitting next to him or the woman sitting next to her has much the same story. They're not exact, of course, but they have much the same story that they're dealing with as they're going through their lives. And, and they become relatable to each other. And once one opens up, then another one will open up and another one will open up and then they'll play off of each other. And it, it is an amazing thing. Um, you know, some people say, well, that's all private and you should keep that confidential and they should be doing this one on one. I disagree totally. Um, in that in that small intimate group setting, you know, of ten to twelve men or women, um, it's it's most beneficial. Uh, I see it time and time again. It's most beneficial that when when because that person that's actually getting uh, processed or ministry uh, to that person, well, that's happening. They're getting ministry too, and um, it's it's very very beneficial. And so phase three is huge. Okay, before you talk about phase four, let me jump in there with about something that I have some familiarity with. Um, in my capacity as a gerontologist, I've done a lot of, uh, I've been to a lot of groups where the people have parents that have Alzheimer's, and they always think that what's happening to them is the same. Their mother or their father accuses them of stealing everything and goes on, and then there was, oh, my mother said the same thing. So I was thinking about just what you were saying. So it's personal, but it's not. They said, oh, I feel so much better. I thought it, right. I was the one. I thought I was the only one dealing with this. So that's what you were saying. Well, you know. why don't we say number four for the next time that you come here? Okay. Because um, this is great for you to explain this. A lot of people don't really understand this. I mean, I as much as I've been close to so many of you, I love to hear this because it helps me to understand more, too. So uh, let me just tell you, you've been listening to um, Rick Aspden, and he is the uh, deputy CEO of Faith Farm Ministries. And we hope that uh, you will be reading the article in November, and we hope that you'll go to Faith Farm Ministries to be able to buy some fabulous things. for. You should do all your Christmas shopping there, I have to tell you that. In fact, I know it's not Christmas yet, but just plan and go do that or have them pick up your stuff or whatever you need so other people can have nice Christmases. Thank you very much, Rick, for being here. Thank you very much for having me. 